I'm a feminist, but I'd rather have dinner with Maya Angelou and Idris Elba. <laughs> and Maya Angelou can leave after the first call. <laughs> So I can spend quality time with Idris. I'll get her an Uber. I'm a feminist, but I like submission. Theatre Royal in Brighton. The Spontaneity Shop presents The Guilty Feminist with Deborah Francis White and guest co host Jessica Foster Q. And very special guests Sharon Horgan and Rebecca Staten talking about fighting. Welcome the BIG Gospel Choir. Oh! 
feminism needs a gospel choir all of the time. <laughs> Don't you feel that? I feel like if you're just going into a meeting, yeah. and that was like one of those really hard meetings where they were all going to be men who were going to sort of sit there passive-aggressively with their arms folded. Yeah. I honestly feel like if you just had a, like a small gospel choir... Don't overdo it. Three, two or three people just behind you I'd going, like, yeah. I'd like to... <laughs> Sister, sing it! <laughs> Sister, sing it. <laughs> Listen to her, Chris. Don't sit there with your arms folded thinking you know more because you're a man because you don't. <laughs> but fuck you, Jeff, while we're at it. <laughs> just saying. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, if I could have you introduce me just every time I get home. Go, what, right, to your husband? Like what, I'm get... not, I don't know how many times I have to go over this. I'm not married. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> to your life partner. Yeah. Yeah. Just, <laughs> what... Uh, you assume, I think, that I'm just far more proper than I am. No, no, I'm taking nothing... it as a compliment. Oh, God, I've gone into terrible territory here where it's not proper to be married. We're feminists. We can choose to be married or choose not to be married, and we all feel it's a little bit more feminist not to be married. Do it. And just stay in a sort of loose just... arrangement. <laughs> now it seems like I'm not married because I'm a feminist, but it's just because it's ten grand. <laughs> It is meant to be, there is something about, like, I am married and I'm all good with that, but some feminists are a bit like, well, it is a sort of arrangement, isn't it, that dates back from when women were property. Yes, yes, it is. But I just honestly don't feel anyone looks at me and Tom and thinks I'm his property. I think <laughs> they just don't get that vibe at dinner parties, <laughs> just from the way that we are. I just don't think anyone's going, ooh, Handmaid's Tale. Um, I just don't. I just don't. Um, so somebody has a charity of the week. Somebody's Ooh. thought of one. Lauren? Brilliant. Hello, What's your Lauren. charity of the week? It's called Rights of Women. Mm. And Perfect. It, yes. And it is a legal advice charity for women who cannot afford legal advice. Um, everybody that volunteers at the, on the advice line that's in, run in the evening has to be a qualified lawyer. Um, in the evening, the advice line is for domestic violence, um, family law, that sort of thing, uh, divorce, financial arrangements, everything like that. In the daytime, there's also um, immigration and um, criminal um, advice lines for Great. women. Okay, and how, oh, amazing. Can, how can we give? Where, what's the link? So the website is www.row.org.uk. ROW.org.uk. And you're going to be here with a pint glass as well, yes. yeah? Yes. So Lauren's going to be at the door with she's a pint just glass. Just having a drink. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> with a it's, pint. It's an empty one, she's going to have a pint of gin in one hand and an empty <laughs> pint glass in the other for you to put your money in. If you would like to donate to Rights of Women, as I'm sure many of you would, uh, Lauren will be at the door. If you're listening at home, go to row.org.uk. We don't charge for the podcast. So if you'd like to put something in to this charity, it sounds absolutely right up our street, and we would love to support that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That is an organisation that is fighting for women's rights. Yeah, we like that. We like, and we've t decided to go with fighting because it feels like we need a bit of a fight right now. And women are often told not to be fighty. Uh, we train girls not to be fighty, and we feel bad about being fighty. And that's why we've got to sort of maybe train ourselves to be a little bit more assertive at times, especially as feminism needs it right now. So let's talk about fighting. Are you ready? Am I going first? You can if you want. You, you go first this time. No? This okay, is, I'll This go is feminism well, manifest, isn't it? No, you go. No, you go. No, you go. No, you go. I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm so blooming keen, I'd actually really like to go first. I want to go first. All right, please welcome to the stage, Jessica Foster <laughs> Hello. Hello. I I should roll my sleeves up if I'm going to talk to you about fighting, but they're pretty tight. Um, <laughs> A fight, a fight is something you put up, like a tent. <laughs> Fights, just like tents in my experience, there's two types. First of all, there's one type of fight that I have, I call it the pop-up fight. Um, these uh, fights are usually small and they're just for one or two people. Just as quickly as you've undone the straps of the situation, boing, they've popped up into a fully formed, oh, come on then, fight. <laughs> and despite the fact that the fight has become fully formed in just a flash, these types of fights are insanely complicated to put away. <laughs> um, 
take ages and ages, a lot of patience, and normally, humiliatingly, someone else's help. <laughs> um, the other type of tight, uh, tent, fight, tight, <laughs> but the bigger ones, the more intentional ones, the more in control, group effort type fights. These are bigger. You wouldn't bother with these if you didn't think that it was worth it. These are the ones with all the poles and the kitchen area, by which I mean the emotional confrontations and the big campaigns for things like justice. Here's where I realise I've taken the tent analogy to its limits. <laughs> Um, I have a lot of fights. Not all of them are the kind that are helpful. My whole family love joking that my baby son has inherited mummy's rage. Um, and I think uh, we've touched on it briefly there. I think as a, a teenager and probably into my 20s, I felt ashamed, I suppose, of the amount of anger I had because it felt like it was very big and loud and very ungirl. And now I feel really proud of my rage, even when it's totally unjustified. <laughs> um, I, um, partner and I do some really good fights. Um, a, lot, a lot of my friends say, oh, we'll start off fighting and it will pretend to be about the little things and it will turn out that was just a mask because it was like, what's this really about? What's this actually really about? And then if you carry the fight on, you get to the stuff that really matters. Me and Mikey do it the other way around. <laughs> so... <laughs> I'll give you an example. We'll start a fight about something really justified. I think this one started about childcare and money. And we'll rejoin it at this bit. I'm just going to act it out for you. <laughs> Look, Mikey, let's just forget about it. Excuse me, can you stop using my name during arguments? <laughs> That's actually really patronising. <laughs> yeah, I don't mean to be patronising. It's just you're winding me up more with your fucking pedantry. <laughs> Listen to yourself. Listen to your tone. <laughs> You're the one who keeps flouncing off. <laughs> you are the aggressor. <laughs> no, Mikey, actually, you're just tired and because of your complete lack of self-awareness, you have no idea when you're being the unreasonable one. No, actually, you're the one being totally unreasonable. Are you sure you're not hungry? <laughs> oh, fuck you! <laughs> Go away! Oh, nice. Tell me to go away. Really nice. Not aggressive at all, that. Not aggressive at all. Yeah. Well, I need you to go away because I'm so annoyed now that I do know I'm not being reasonable. But before you've gone away, I just want you to know, actually, that I really hate it when you eat standing up in the kitchen. When you eat... I hate it when you're just standing up for that whole meal. I just sit on a chair. Why? Why would you hate that? I don't know, actually. It just disgusts me. Well, whatever, Jess. You're actually making me really close to saying what actually you're doing that's really pissed me off. Well, just say it. <laughs> no, I don't want to say it because you'll go mad. <laughs> just fucking say it, Mike. <laughs> you closed the jar's cupboard too hard and one of the joints at the top of the cupboard's coming apart. <laughs> <laughs> I just close it like a normal fucking cupboard. Like. <laughs> well, it's never falling apart when you're away, and as soon as you're home, all the edges are coming apart within a day. And every time I talk to you about it, you just laugh as if you don't even care. <laughs> it's because I don't. <laughs> well, you should, because it's high up, and eventually there's going to be a terrible accident. <laughs> and it's only through seeing that fight out to its end that we got to the really important <laughs> stuff <laughs> that, it, that it was really about. And so, as we finish that fight to its natural end, now, if I have to watch Mikey eat, he sits down, and I close that jar's cupboard like I'm doing surgery on its brain. <laughs> and I always leave a little crevice open. I don't even fully close it anymore. So I've really cared about his concerns. Um, I'd say one of the most worthwhile... I've never been scared of confrontations. I think a lot of my friendships are made much stronger by... If there's an issue saying what it is, even if it's eggy, even if it feels really claggy, I'd say one of the most worthwhile confrontations I've ever had is with my dad. I feel like I need to preface this bit with a caveat that my dad is a very funny and generous man. Um, <laughs> 
So don't fully judge him on what I'm about to say. Um, it's fine, though. He won't listen to this. <laughs> of course he doesn't listen to my work. Why do you think I chose this job? Um, I... <laughs> Now, he's angry about a lot of things. He's also, confusingly, really f- loves through food. He's a real feed, feed, feed. He really loves to feed. While simultaneously hating fat people. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's very confusing when you grow up. <laughs> when I was a fat kid, watching him call fat people disgusting while simultaneously giving me a sausage roll, three boosts and an ice cream. Um, <laughs> And I never packed up, I never packed up about this. And then in my 20s, I've got very young half-siblings, and in my early 20s, I was at uni, and um, I went to my dad's house for the day, and my three-year-old half-sister, Amy, after lunch, we had a Sunday lunch, and afterwards she said, Jess, I want to tell you something. And I said, oh, what? And she went, when you come for lunch after you leave, Dad says, Jess is a big fat pig. (laughs) And I... I was furious and I was so upset and I thought, now forget about it. And then I thought, no, for the first time ever, I thought, I'm going to confront him about it. Like, fuck you, I'm going to confront him about it. I arranged to meet him for lunch the next week in London and we had lunch and I didn't muck about quite early on in it. I said, Dad, this is what Amy said that you do. You called me a big fat pig. And he said, I'd never do that. I'd absolutely never do that. I'd never said that. She's just shit stirring. <laughs> She's three. (laughs) And I, cowardly, I kind of just thought, yeah, okay. And he moved the conversation straight on. He hates conversation. He moved it. No, 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 I would never do that. I would never do that. And I went with it. I was so scared of upsetting. I went with it and we talked about everything but and made it all sort of pretend really jolly like it had never happened. And he went to the loo and I sat there and I thought, oh, I think... I felt really disappointed, very dissatisfied. And I thought, I think what I wanted was some sort of acknowledgement, some sort of apology. And and so I felt a bit gutted. And then just as we were going to leave, and it had never happened before, he just gave me a hundred quid cash. (laughs) Get in, that'll do as a sorry. Who needs words? Who needs words? Um, (laughs) I almost always think that putting up a fight tent is worth it, whether the fight's for equality for women, a wounded relationship, or a very dangerous cupboard. Thank you. Your three-year-old sibling yeah. saying that reminds me of someone I know where their very small child was staring at their grandmother while she was drinking a cup of tea like this. And she was like, what are you looking at? And he said, Daddy said you drink like a fish. <laughs> he probably didn't mean tea. No, no. She was looking for, like, gills or... So we found out backstage we accidentally did the same challenge. Um, <laughs> yeah. We both went to kickboxing. Oh, to... mine didn't have any kicking. Oh, did your so not? It's yours had, yours had boxing. Yours yeah. boxing. I do lots of yoga, which is all very om and peace and, you know, breathing. And I just thought, it's not very fighty yoga. I mean, that's one of the main things about it. <laughs> one of the key tenets of yoga is stop fighting. If being anything, more you're pretty vulnerable in a downward dog. <laughs> That's true, actually. This is a great... I was surprised there aren't more yoga class muggins. Yeah. <laughs> so... Anyone ideas. Yeah, yeah. So I thought, I'm going to go and punch something. Um, so I did a kickboxing class, and I have to say, it was incredibly liberating, and I'm definitely going to punch things more often. It just gets something out. Mm. I mean, I would say do it... For me, I need to do it with a balance of yoga. I'll always be more yoga than punching. Will you? Yeah, yoga's I'll my happy I'll be the yin place. to your yang, mate. Will you always Um, be more punchy than yoga? Yeah. Yeah. Um, (laughs) I've had meditation recommended to me by so many people. It's just another thing on the to-do list. Um, It's... um, I did kickboxing when I was 16, and it's one of the best things ever, actually. It's really good Mm. kind of release of a load of tension that at the time I didn't know was there. Yeah, I went back to a boxing class, a boxing fitness class, and the first time I went... There was only three of us in the class, and I cried and puked. Wow. So it was a challenge to go back, and it... <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'd mentioned you, it on are. another one of these podcasts. I said, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a feminist, but I tried a box fit class, and hashtag this girl can't. <laughs> and you said, but would you go back? And I was like, yeah. And I thought, <laughs> I wouldn't. <laughs> but I've said it now. 
So it's this weird thing where I'm walking into this room where the woman's looking at me like, really? Why have you come back? Like, oh. And I looked like I was like, bring it. I like that kind of pain. I like humiliation. Bring me more. But really, you know, all the while going, I'm only here for a challenge for a podcast. You think I'm like Rocky, like spoiling for more punishment. And actually, the second time, it was better, but only because, like, another 25 people turned up. And as they were all arriving, I was like, have you guys done this class before? It's horrid. Like, I just had a little gossip with everyone before. Well, you were there undermining people at the door. Yeah. <laughs> Going, Don't, you're going to help I just wanted some support. I just wanted some, an army on my side. And did you feel more powerful when you did it? Just being honest, I haven't thought this through. There were just more places to hide. She just wasn't watching me the whole time because there's more people to look at. Oh, I see, bigger class. And there was, because yeah. there's a bigger class, so not as much room, way less skipping. And that was the bit I'd hate it. <laughs> I've always hated skipping. <laughs> I've hated skipping since first school. I don't think I've tried it since then. That's the part in boxing that girls are generally good at because we are made to skip as children. I don't know, children are probably not made to skip anymore. Do you remember when we had to skip? And it was just part of, if you wanted to be in with girls at my school, you had to skip, you had to hula hoop, you had to play jacks. That's how we it went. We weren't made. To, I grew up in the countryside and we had to do country dancing. Did you? Yes. I'd like and to I see that. To, I always got paired up in Naughty John. <laughs> oh, that sounds quite fun. <laughs> no. I don't know why. Maybe this is on topic for fighting, but it's probably the, one of the worst things I've ever done. But when we were at first school, Naughty John, and this is part of it, classic Naughty John, he would repeatedly, when the teacher wasn't watching, and we were all kind of milling around, um, he would, every time I went to sit down, he'd pull my chair away just before mm. I sat down, and I'd sit on the floor. Oh. And it happened two or three times, and I was utterly humiliated. For my revenge, I kind of overdid it a little bit, and I stabbed him in the stomach with a sharp pencil. Oh! <laughs> yes. <laughs> I wasn't allowed... I don't know why that's made me remember it. But, um, fighting. I, fighting. Yeah, it's fighting. So that was your, I wasn't, that I was wasn't your... allowed to go out at break times or lunchtime for, I think, like a week. I had nightmares about it. <laughs> they made me not included because of my terrible violence. But I think... <laughs> I think girls are punished more for violence. I think there's a boys will be boys attitude. There certainly wasn't my school. Mm. Where boys would fight all the time and people would stand around going, fight, fight, fight. Fight, fight. But if girls were doing that, I mean, that would have been a, like a, a shocking thing. Yeah. But you know, the only really proper good actual fists hit faces fight I ever saw through all of school, and I was at mixed schools all the way through and comprehensives, was in the sixth form, two of my friends, two women, girls, women, 16 year old girls, 16 year old women, girls. What? And they, <laughs> they went at each other. Yeah. Actual punching in faces. Wow. Wow. Yeah. You liked it, and didn't you? I, we did. We all really liked it. And the, the way that the teachers dealt with it was to drag them both into a room and shut the door. So they just carried on in there. Wow. You could hear them throwing each other against walls. Wow. Sometimes you just got to fight it out. Yeah. Um, fabulous people of Brighton, would you please put your hands together and welcome Deborah Francis White? <laughs> Sometimes you meet someone, don't you? And they say, my partner and I never fight. We just never fight. We just don't fight. My partner and I never fight. We just don't fight. We, we don't fight. And what I want to say to that person is, fuck you. <laughs> fuck you. Fuck you. And that's why I'm not married to that person. Uh, quite clearly. But not fighting is not an indication that your relationship is healthy. There was a book came out a few years ago. There was a study by a chap who could watch you and your partner chatting and predict if you were going to be together in seven years' time incredibly accurately, like he was so good at it. And he broke it down into three things. Couples that turn towards, couples that turn against, and couples that turn away. Turning towards and turning against are the good ones. Turning away, not so much. Your marriage will not last, or if it does, it would be awful. So this is turning towards. <laughs> Your partner says, do you fancy going to the cinema? I'd love to go to the cinema. What shall we see? This is turning against. Would you like to go to the cinema, darling? No. <laughs> I would not like to go to the fucking cinema because I'm tired. I explained that I was tired when I came in. But you did not listen to that. And you don't have to get up at six o'clock tomorrow morning again, do you? No. You can sleep until lunchtime because that's what you do. <laughs> so why don't you go to the fucking cinema with somebody else? 
yes. And do not tell me what you saw because I don't give a fuck. <laughs> and turning away is, would you like to go to the cinema? What else? Don't hear. That one is worse than the second one. Couples that turn towards or against are healthy. So if your partner says, did you not get round to doing the hoovering then? <laughs> the better response is, no, cock face, I didn't. And I'm never fucking getting around to it again. <laughs> that is better than what? I don't know. No. That is honestly better. Your relationship will last longer. <laughs> And we all know people, we all know people who shouldn't be together. We all know people who you think, how has that relationship lasted? They're awful together. <laughs> Some of you may be thinking of yourselves. <laughs> sure. I think regular relationships uh, last a lot longer than celebrity relationships. Uh, you know, we always think celebrities are flaky because they leave, you know, they're sort of, you don't even married a year or six months or, you know, six years or whatever, and you're just on to another one. But I honestly think more of us would do that if we had that celebrity option. Because when we fight with our partner, like that really bad row that you have like once a year, is that just, is that just my relationship? <laughs> Who has a nuclear row once a year? Yeah, yeah, great, thank you, thank you. They're coming out of the closet now. When you have a nuclear row with your partner, you go, right, fuck you, that is it, I am going. And you leave, you walk out and you slam the door and you walk to a pub and you order yourself a double gin and tonic and you sit there thinking, this is fucking over. This is fucking over. I don't know, why would I fucking bother? Why do I fucking bother with him or her? Why, why, why do I bother? I mean, it's really, this is over, this is over. And then you leave the pub and you walk around the block three times. And you haven't got anywhere else to go. So you go home and you think, I'm not sleeping in the same bed as him. I'm not, I'm not fucking sleeping. I'll sleep in the box room, assuming you live outside of London and you have, <laughs> you have any other space. I'll sleep in the box room. I'm sleeping in the fucking box room. I'm not sleeping with him. And you go into the box room and you've forgotten that the sofa bed in the box room is piled high with like big bags of clothes for Oxfam <laughs> and old DVDs that you women sort through and then you never did. And you think, well, I'm fucking, I'm, why should I fucking sleep in here? He could fucking sleep in here. I'm not fucking sleeping in here. And you go upstairs into the bedroom and he's already asleep. So you go, fuck it. Well, I'm not. If he's in the bed, I've got to sleep in the bed. I'm fucking sleeping in the bed because I don't see why he should get a bed when he is such an asshole and I shouldn't have a bed. So you get into the bed and then he kind of rolls over and he sort of just puts an arm over you and goes, sorry, you were so unreasonable before. <laughs> and then you say, well, I'm sorry. I'm married to a massive asshole. And then you have a little cuddle and he tries to go in for makeup sex and you go, I told you I got that thing in the morning. And that's why you're still with your partner. It's logistics. <laughs> because of course, of course, if you're Jennifer Aniston or Gwyneth Paltrow or Ben Affleck, I mean, if you're Gwyneth Paltrow, you're married to Chris Martin. That's got to be in some ways a pretty sweet deal. I don't know. I mean, in other ways, no. I mean, I suppose he'd wake up in the morning and he'd be there going, I will fix you. You'd be like, can you stop saying that? I'm not broken, it's insulting. <laughs> of course, these marriages have their bubbling annoyances like any other marriage. I will fix you. I've asked you. It was a big hit, it was a number one hit. I don't give a fuck if it was a number one hit. I don't want to hear it every morning. <laughs> I will fix you. You're just doing it to annoy me now. So things like that bubble up in those relationships. And at one point, when they have their nuclear row, she storms out, she goes, fuck this, fuck you, fuck it, it's over. She drives to her house in Malibu, <laughs> she changes the locks, and she issues divorce papers within that first angry 24-hour window, and who's going to climb down? Nobody. What I'm saying is you are with your partner because you can't afford to leave. <laughs> All of us would behave at work like Russell Crowe and throw a phone at somebody for some days. <laughs> what stops you is you can't afford to lose your job. <laughs> Think about the person at work you would most like to throw a phone at. <laughs> Look, have you pictured that person? Take aim in your mind and release, like do the hand gesture. Release at the head, release. You're not doing the hand gesture, there's no therapy in this unless you're released, ready? Pull back, you've got the phone, they're horrible. They're unreasonable. They fucked you over again. Release! See, it's quite good. See, do you see what I'm saying? Is we would all be fightier if we could afford to be. 
But and I think now feminism is coming into a time when we do need to be fightier because because of austerity. There are many women now who can't afford to, really can't afford to leave. And by, I mean, can't afford the bus fare. My friend, I've got an Australian friend, and she always says in any relationship or work situation, she has what she calls her JGF fund. Stands for Go Get Fucked Fund. <laughs> so she can just walk out the door. And a lot of women do not have that because of austerity. They don't. They are in a bad relationship. So we need, women of influence, if you're in this room, you have some influence because otherwise you wouldn't be at a podcast show about feminism. So we need to get fight here now. We do need to get fight here. And sometimes there's a sort of stereotype of the angry feminist, the fighty feminist. Like there's a stereotype of the angry lesbian or the angry black woman. But the thing is, fightiness and anger are a product of exclusion. It's what happens if you're routinely excluded. Most people who are routinely excluded will self-exclude, but some members of that tribe will go, I'm sick of you excluding people like me. I demand inclusion. That will happen. And that's what the stereotype of the angry feminist, the angry lesbian, the angry black woman is. The more often you're excluded, the more routinely excluded, the more angry you might get. And if you don't think white men get angry when they're excluded, (laughs) try starting a women's network in your industry. (laughs) Try starting a women's cinema night. (laughs) Try starting a women of colour writers group and see if white men don't get angry when they're excluded. Because there's nothing particular about feminists or black women or lesbians that are angry. It's just that fighting for change looks angrier than fighting for the status quo. Thank you very much. Super job. When you were throwing the phone at the head, Mm, mm. I was thinking, I've just got a new phone. Um, So I wonder if for future analogies, we could swap that for a brick. (laughs) I think brick's going to do too much damage. I think Uh, psychologically letting yourself... Is it just a Lego brick? (laughs) Duplo, duplo. Well, a Lego brick could do damage to the eye. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I mean look, I'm keen to phone. do a little bit of damage. Sure, sure. <laughs> Depends what you're thinking of. I think we should bring on our guests, please. <laughs> you will know her from all sorts of amazing shows, including Doctor Who. That's right. Uh, you will know her from Pulling and also from Raised by Wolves. Uh, she is Rebecca Staten. <laughs> Someone we know and love who created Pulling and also created the wonderful catastrophe. It's Sharon Horgan. <laughs> Have you ever had a fist fight, Rebecca? Yeah. Oh, tell me. One of the things I'm most proud of... Has anyone ever been to the press club in Manchester? Yes. Oh, that lady. <laughs> um, it's, um, it's an establishment that is not, shall we say, impressive... It's a little bit murky. I am most proud that I am actually barred from the press club for fighting. Hey! <laughs> yeah. Wow. Basically, this girl, I warned her three times. She, <laughs> she, <laughs> she walked over to my fella, who was quite well-oiled at the time. He'd have got off with a bin bag. <laughs> That's why I'm with him. Um, <laughs> and she just kept making moves on him. And I just, I said the first time, oh, sweetheart, he's with me. So... Uh, wow. <laughs> that, that was the first one. Second time, I tapped her on the shoulder. I said, are you taking the piss? And she went... Mm. And, um, and then I just jumped on her. <laughs> <laughs> and they carried me out like that. <laughs> uh, like I was crowd diving. I shouldn't be proud of it, but I am. It's funny. We're sort of proud of it too. If that was a man telling that story, I'd go, oh, well, it's not good to be violent. But because it's a woman and we're sort of, supp- our violence is suppressed, right. there's a sort of celebration when we hear it. Right. Have you ever had a fight in any physical way, Sharon? <laughs> not really. My friend punched me in the head once. <gasps> Whoa. Yeah. You went more Irish when you said that. Uh, <laughs> she was heavily pregnant, or I would have um, probably hit her back. Hmm. But I was so impressed by the fact that she was. Heavily pregnant and still able to throw a really Why mean... did she punch you? I'm, I can't say. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, it this story was, is so good. It. Yeah. it was, no, it was, you know. Yeah. It, was something, it was nasty verbal. And like Rebecca, <laughs> she's from the north. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> so uh, that was her response. But I remember it feeling really like the oddest sensation. thing ever. The weirdest sensation, just that like sort of 
mad adrenaline because I kind of forgot that she was heavily pregnant for a couple of seconds and sort of yeah. like went wimbly in. No, I didn't wimble in. But, um, <laughs> Why are you still friends today? Yeah, no, we are. No, it's good. Because I, I think... You cleared the air, exactly. I think sometimes that no, happens. It's good, it's good, and I think, like, I'm definitely feistier than I was when I was younger, but I still don't know what to do with my anger a lot of the time, and a lot of the time it just comes out as hostility, <laughs> you know, <laughs> via email. <laughs> <laughs> I, but we but I, I, I wish I was better. I wish I could get out of that... Holden Caulfield, just this is what I would say if you know, email. Yeah. Yeah. But no, I can't. I had one fight with a mum at my kids' school because I'd been away filming and I hadn't been around and I was already feeling really sort of tense about the fact that I wasn't doing the drop off or the mm. pickup. And she was always just a little bit snidey. And then one morning I had been filming for, I'm sure it was when we were doing pulling when Sylvie was in primary. And uh, I turned up and she went, Well, you know, nice surprise seeing you here. <gasps> And I just went, oh, shut up, <laughs> Linda, whatever her name was. And just thinking it was going to, you know, feeling that sort of adrenaline thing. Because I would never normally do that. I would, yeah. I would normally just go, ah, yeah, sorry, I haven't been around very much because, you know, I'm working. But I still, you know, I do bedtime and, I, you know, I'm there for bath. Well. <laughs> but, uh, but I told her to shut up. And then I dropped my girl into class and I came out and I was like, you know, fuming and sort of ready to have it out with her. And uh, she, <laughs> she was parked out the front of the school crying and uh, <gasps> I went over to the car and we ended up putting it sort of in catastrophe yeah, a bit but yeah but she was same. like she was like you know I'm a terrible mother I don't know why I said that I'm never you should see me I, I mean I'm, I'm not even happy I don't even like my kids a lot of the time I went into this full-blown you know, and I ended up like hugging her through the window oh. just like and so that was good that cleared the air mm. yeah. <laughs> It's interesting sometimes how that happens. My friend, Justin Rosenholtz, who's a person in American, so slightly Dorothy Parker, she always says to me, you never know how strong your friendship is until you've had a fight with someone. Yeah. Mm. You don't know. Because if you fight with them and you never see them again, you know they're not a real friend. So you've sort of got to have a fight. And I've thought at some points in friendships, I don't know if you're a real friend, maybe I'll pick one and we'll see. I haven't really, I haven't really, I've really done I, that. I do that. My, are you my real husband... I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to pick a fight with you yeah. and find out. I think it needs to reach its full conclusion to get that satisfying kind of thing where you've built that stronger relationship off the back of the beginning of the fight. Like, I think I had some anger management once. <laughs> um, as part of a job where I was, for years, I was a zombie in Madame Two Swords. Wow. Really kicking it as an actor <laughs> and, um, basically like really gorily done up in the dark jumping out at people mm. and the idea is that you really really scare them and you do like this ridiculous <laughs> boot camp of auditions to get in where you have to develop this character that's really horrible and really really terrify people and it's great fun but as part of it because often people in there like you say like in the moment when someone does you feel attacked people would <laughs> really badly hit us like oh. smack you back and so they gave us this massive ang- we all had to go through this really long anger management training so that if we got hit what to go and do to go and get rid of it and i remember being surprised that it wasn't anything about calm meditative like there was no deep was it breathing. masturbation <laughs> yeah basically <laughs> you're all <laughs> thinking it you're all we thinking all it. had a dark room couple of shots of cow pole and a wank there we go yeah um, <laughs> It's basically star jumps. <laughs> really? Which is the equivalent, is it not? Yeah. 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 Star jumps? Yeah, and like going up and down some steps until you're really sweaty. They time you that you were definitely knackered. So you that had all of your sounds, adrenaline gone. That sounds really handmade to tell to me. <laughs> that, like, you back in you've just scary. been beaten can... on the job by a customer. Yeah. <laughs> and you're probably on, you know, five quid an hour as an actor... Now, because you've been hurt, you're going to run up and down some stairs until you forget, until the pain until of running you, up and down the well, stairs. Well, no, until you knackered all your adrenaline yeah. out, so you haven't got the strength to fight I'm back. I'm not yeah. sure about this at all. And then you really are a zombie. Yeah. <laughs> I've had some great jobs. I've noticed more fighting feminism in the last... Like, we've all seen it, like, in the last couple of... You know, certainly since Trump and Brexit, everyone's gone, fuck, and we're out on the streets now a lot more. Is that going to escalate? Hopefully not, because that means everything's just getting worse and worse. But, I mean, I definitely think, certainly, there's a huge movement in the US with women just being prepared to sort of get themselves arrested, you Mm. know, to make their point and get noticed. So I think there's 
definitely a kind of fearlessness now because mm. everyone's so angry that they kind of think, fuck it, what's the worst thing that can happen? Yeah. How bad would things have to get? Would you ever smash stuff up and go to jail? If yeah. I needed some time yeah. off, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, smash whatever you want. Yeah. What do you want smashing? Let's smash. When I feel depressed uh, about, about the world, I comfort myself, and, and this is only relevant to people who've seen Raised by Wolves, sorry, but the girls who play my daughters, especially the older ones, are so bright mm. and they're way more intelligent than me and they're better educated and they are so politically motivated that we're going to be all right. Yeah. That's, I just want you all to know we're going to be all right. Yeah. The girls have got it covered. Yeah. This and if not, we'll be dead. So. Yeah. <laughs> I sometimes do think that. I go to a corporate thing and they'll have a futurist on saying, by 2035, uh, we won't be arguing about oil, we'll be arguing about water, and we won't have enough water to drink. And I always think, could I be dead by then? 2035. And then I think, not really. Not unless a bad thing happens. It's really, really, really old. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to be that old, Sharon. Really, really, I'm gonna really. Be, I'm going to be really older really S. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> I think you've massively overestimated my age. Oh, I'm a feminist part. Mm. It's yeah. true, though, yeah. Do you feel that with your teenage daughter? Do you see there's a sort of... They just seem more motivated or more politically aware. You can be honest now because she's asleep. Uh, <laughs> yeah, she is, actually. And it's a really scary time for that reason because... Honestly, I don't have any answers for her. Like, I can't explain to her why this shit is going down. And, like, she woke up in the morning that we found out that Trump was elected. She, you know, I started crying because I just found it so upsetting that they would rather, mm. you know, over a woman, you know, mm. basically at the end of the day, emails or whatever. But it was, you know, they didn't want a woman in that position. And the fact that I couldn't sort of explain that to her or give her, you know, I mean, I hope <laughs> I hope I give her some kind of hope, you yeah. know. She came on the Women's March with me and, and really wanted to and wanted her friends to go. And uh, But, yeah, they do seem to be. I mean, much more so than when, when I oh, was God, a kid. I, had no, I don't think I had any idea of that idea. I've seen teenagers. There were, there were teenagers... Like, just friends of mine who are teenagers on the night of the Trump election, but also will be doing it for the general election, they've got a war room, and it's because they've got technology as well. Like, on different iPads and devices and phones and stuff, they were watching CNN, and they were watching... They'd set up, like, a war room, and they were colouring in the states oh on a chart. God. And they're, like, 13 and 15. I remember my 8-year-old turning up for school one day, and her friend Sophie, who's this amazing kid, just sort of walking along with her mum, holding her hand, going, Aimer, Aimer! Martin McGuinness is dead. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Paper was like... Loving. <laughs> 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 My friend's kid came home and she was saying, she's only like six, and she was saying, I think it was maybe, it must have been when the, the Tories got in last time, and she was saying... They, she just heard them all talking that the blue ones got in and we don't like the blue ones. Um, we like the red ones. Well, I like the green ones because the green ones like the trees and they were just so sweet. And like, the, which ones do you like? My mum likes the yellow ones, but I like the red ones. Like they were, she was like, are you talking about M&Ms or something? And then she just tuned in and she realised that's how they'd sort of categorised it. But actually, their simplistic view of the world was fairly spot on. Um, that's... Like, simplifying it like that, I'll never forget. When I grew up, there was... People had spikes in their garden with who they were voting for. Like, and it was quite like, basically, where I'm from in Dorset's complete Tory stronghold. But my parents weren't. And I remember asking mum, like, that young, like, what's the difference then? Can you just explain to me what the difference is? And, I, and she basically was just like, well, the Tories want rich people to get richer. And the Labour ones, the red ones, they just want everyone to all have the same or enough. And I was like, why would anyone... Go and vote for those Tories, and she was like, I don't know. <laughs> I just don't think my opinion's really changed since I was five on that. If you, sometimes you boil it down to that simple, it's yeah, like, it's oh well. Though. It is. Um, if you have any girls, Rebecca, yeah. will you teach them to be a bit fighty? Yeah. Would you like them? How do you deal with that with girls? Because if you see them being violent as children, obviously we, we don't want children to be violent. But I also think if I had a daughter, I'd sort of want a bit of scrap. I'm sorry, Deborah. Thing. I've just got to stop you there. <laughs> I don't have a problem with if a kid comes over to my kid and hits my kid, regardless of my kid's sex, they should hit that kid back. <laughs> you are like the mum in Raised by Wolves, aren't you? <laughs> no. <laughs> an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. <laughs> if you're listening at home, Rebecca Staten is punching her palm repeatedly. 
<laughs> no, I just, I've got older brothers. So, you know, if I hadn't learnt to handle myself, then I would probably not be alive today. <laughs> and you think I'm exaggerating, but I remember my brothers coming up to me and going, we've made this swing. <laughs> it's amazing. There's this piece of wood. Don't worry about the nail that's turned the wrong way up. What we're going to do is we're going to swing you. You can go first. And then we're just going to see if you hit the nail. Oh. <laughs> right? So what? it's important that I learn to handle myself. What so if was I have a response to that? She just I was like, all right. Shop oh, yeah. I was like, all right. So my I did sister it. used to do those things to me, though. My sister used to, she was four years older, and you're just so much cleverer when you're four years older when you're a kid. Mm. And she used to make me eat chilies from the garden. We got this beautiful <laughs> doll's house for <laughs> one Christmas. And, you know, we weren't sort of super rich or anything, but it was, so it was a really big deal that we had this beautiful Swiss doll's house. And it was all sort of little carved people, this family who lived in it. And she said, we're going to play a game now called Rich Man, Poor Man. <laughs> My dolls are these dolls, and they live in this rich house. Your dolls are two cotton reels who live under the piano. <laughs> and she, basically, she would have voted blue at that age. She would have voted blue at that age. Not now, not now. And it was always this game. She still, we still joke about it to this day, that I was always poor man. Should have really been poor people. I look back now and I feel ashamed. Uh, but the game was that her dolls would come and visit mine under the cotton reels under the piano and go, oh, you don't have much. <laughs> and then mine would go and visit hers and she would show me around the palatial mansion and basically just show the fuck off. Uh, that was the game. Um, girls can be very cruel. Like, there was not this a was, lot of Yeah, this was what I was going to say. Right? What I found difficult when I went to school was that the law of, I don't like what you've just done, bam, <laughs> uh, it's over, we're friends, that I had with my brothers, did not work with these new relationships that I was forming with girls. So I, I didn't really make friends because it was so sophisticated, mm. the way girls fight. And mm. What, they didn't respond to you, like, wanting to go <laughs> fighting well, him? Yeah, no, they, 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 yeah, I can't believe it. Yeah. What were they thinking? <laughs> no, but you know, like, the oh, well, you know, you can sit by Stacey today. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you can't go to the upper sixth with Laura because she's already going with Becky. I honestly so don't know no. how girls don't end up hitting each other. Right? I mean, at that age. Because oh, it's so, many. so... Tactical. Yeah. They're so bright, though. I remember that sort of tactical alliance yeah, and stuff. I'm I was always on the wrong This is really bad, right? To take my revenge, because I really hated them, I found some little plastic bags. You know that sometimes you could put buttons in, but they also look like the kind of plastic bags that you could have drugs in. Yeah. <laughs> So, I got some icing sugar. <gasps> right? This is Machiavellian. I put it in all the bags and I went, oh, you won't believe it, I found it under my brother's bed, do you want to try it? Well, there was a queue. Ten girls, right? Cut to 20 minutes into lunch. Oh, can you feel it? Can you feel it? Is your heart going funny? Is your heart going funny? Oh, God, I'm going to pass out. I'm going to pass out. It's the drugs, it's the drugs. <laughs> <laughs> Just to be clear, did they snort icing sugar? No, they were rubbing it on their gums. How did I know to tell them to do that? Anyway, they were rubbing it on their gums and it was literally like the crucible. Wow. <laughs> OK, have we got a question up here? Hello. 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 You were talking about fighty children, about not wanting to encourage your, your hypothetical daughters to get into fights. Now, I was quite a fighty child. Yes. I would very routinely get into kicking, punching, screaming fights with the young boys at school. However, looking back on that, I can see it was because the young boys at school were trying to flip up my best friend's skirt yes. or harassing her or teasing her. Yes. And so my fighting was based on the fact that no one was intervening. And I think, so looking back on that, I'm quite shocked at the fact that there was a very boys will be boys attitude that was left to the girls in the class to police themselves vigorously to pre prevent. Yeah. And so I suppose there's, I, I have a lot of ambivalence about how much we want to encourage our girls to be fighty and how much we want to say that's completely inappropriate. We need to have adults who are able to intervene. Wow, so you were like a feminist superhero as a child. Yeah. That is the view I like to hold now, yes. Yeah. <laughs> you had a cape. If we'd been friends, you could have protected me. Yeah. I Does wouldn't have needed the sugar. <laughs> Does someone behind you have an answer? Do you have an answer to the question? No, I was just going to say, well, the boys have not been brought up right. 
Like they've not been like the problem is the the boys doing that. That that's what needs to get stopped. <gasps> Like, if, rather, if you, rather than the girls you. fighting. Yes. It, the, if the, either of my daughters were um, beating up little boys for um, looking up their girlfriend's skirts, I'd be totally fine with that. That's, mm. yeah. that's, <laughs> but, and, but and man who said that, what's your name? Uh, Oliver. And are you single? Because <laughs> <laughs> if you can't pull in yeah. here, Oliver, now after that, you can't pull in a women's prison. <laughs> you, need to, you need to, yeah. You need I, to walk up to people and say, hi, I'm Oliver at the are end you, of this. Are you single, I'm... Oliver, just out of interest? <laughs> yes. You I are am, single? Yeah. yeah, yeah. What a waste. Oh, come on, who's single? Not Down here. Okay. Hands up, please. Hands up. What Let's get this. Do? I'm going to need to know more now, Oliver. What do you do? I make music videos and commercials. Oh, oh fancy. How old are you? How old are you? I'm just... Uh, I'm 26. 26. Are. Are, you, are you... Can I, can I ask... I don't want to be heteronormative. Straight okay. or gay? Sorry? Straight or gay? I'm don't straight, want to yeah. You're straight? Yeah. So we have I a straight 26-year-old super feminist <laughs> yeah, yeah. music video director who thinks it's all men's fault. <laughs> oh my God. What, this do guy I, is fit. Do I have... Who's going to give me £100? Okay, pounds? 100, do I hear £100? Pounds? Do I hear... But, but now, now let's play the video where he talks about his secret hobby. <laughs> uh, well, Oliver, where will you be after this? I'm uh, probably just having a drink. Outside. Where? Uh, I, I, I don't know. It's, I mean, well, you're falling well. apart. He's falling oh, apart. Like, this, this is so this aggressive. Is, he's he's falling apart. apart. From, from this angle, scary. what's really nice is the word bar. It's just above your yeah. head. Yeah. So I think that's where you Oliver should be. Oliver will be in a bar. If you can find him, you deserve it. I'll be knocking about, like, around, I guess, you know. <laughs> Oliver's fallen apart. I don't want to pressure you, Oliver. I am, I'm genuinely trying to find you a wonderful woman because I don't... There aren't enough Olivers in the what world. What the fuck is going on? I don't know. I just... <laughs> Follow The Guilty Feminist on Twitter at GuiltFemPod. Check out our Instagram, instagram.com forward slash The Guilty Feminist. Like our Facebook page, sign up to our mailing list to get notified as soon as a new episode is released. And please go to iTunes and rate, review and subscribe. It helps other people find the podcast. And give it five stars. Okay, uh, so that was a, a very interesting and exciting... Uh, I feel quite... I feel, yeah. I, feel, I feel like a fight, I'll be honest. Uh, <laughs> I could do that okay. right now. Right, okay. Oh, no, I'm scared. <laughs> you shouldn't be. I've got terrible upper body strength. You would win any fight. You would win any fight. We could arm wrestle and you'd win. Come on. I've seen this. No. Okay. Seriously, you will win. No, I've seen this Ready? in my dreams. Right, but really put you back into it. I move that I will. Because I'm left-handed, so I'm really giving you a good go in. I'm left-handed. Oh. <laughs> Ready? <laughs> give, yourself, give, you, give yourself more of a chance. Okay. Three, two... I'm going to do that thing that blokes do where they don't, they don't start. Oh, shit. <laughs> I'm so oh, bad. Three, oh, two, oh. one. Yeah, I'm not starting. <laughs> Fucking hell. Oh, if you are strong, I would not fight you in a bar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure. For the listeners. That felt, that felt sexy. Deborah there got... Yeah, it was sexy. That De felt sexy. I felt Deborah like a boy. Deborah got whopped. <laughs> uh, can I just say a huge, huge thank you to Sharon Horgan, who I know cancelled other things that she really wanted to do to be here. <laughs> thank you so much. I think, honestly, you're a bit of a feminist hero of mine because you've made your own work, you've made Absolutely. your own way in the industry, yeah. you've just said fuck you to everybody and started a company. I've made email. work for others, my Via dad. email, you've said fuck you to everybody. <laughs> and you've started your own company. It's super successful. You, you, you don't stop making shows now. You're making them in America. Uh -huh. How many shows are you making at the moment? Um, Catastrophe, well, divorce. Various divorce and, yeah, Catastrophe, Bliss and Motherland. But, you know, they're co-productive. You're making it sound better than it is. No. But it's good. <laughs> no. I imagine if I said that to a man, you're making four things, I'm making eight. Uh, I've got four, another four in development, love. Uh, you are phenomenal and you really are an inspiration. And thank you so much for coming and giving up other lovely things. Thank you. And also, Rebecca, your portrayal of a mother who was the most well-rounded, like, 12-dimensional person who had so much fight in her, was so outstanding. I really wish you got more series because I think it was such a feminist show and I just thought it was absolutely incredible and I can't wait to see what you do next. <laughs> also, a big thanks to my wonderful co-host, Jessica foster -Q. I'm a feminist, but she is too funny. 
She's just too fucking funny and brings it all onto the stage. I'm just always in awe of any of my co hosts who come along, but Jess, I just absolutely adore. Thank you so much for coming with me. And a big, big thank you to the Theatre Royal Brighton for giving us this amazing establishment, yeah, um, which normally has posh plays in it, and uh, they're slamming it tonight with us. Thank you to the Brighton Festival for having us, for hosting us, and a huge, huge thank you to the BIG Choir. <laughs> You have been an absolutely fantastic, wonderful audience. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much, Brighton. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sharon, what show of yours should we watch? Oh, um, uh, Motherland. Watch Motherland coming up. It's going to be absolutely um, amazing. But I've no idea when. Also, can I just say that when I was mentioning a bunch of shows, I didn't mention my business partner, Clearly Mountford, who does it all with me. And so, you know, that was another... Uh... Clearly it is amazing. I was afraid, I was petrified, kept thinking I could never live without you by my side, and I spent oh so many nights thinking how you did me wrong, and I grew strong. Oh, go on now, go. Go. Walk out the door.
Anti Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White. Guest co host, Jessica Foster Q. And our very special guests, Sharon Horgan and Rebecca Staten. And the BIG Gospel Choir. The recording engineer was Chris Sharp. The music was by Mark Hodge. The producer was Tom Zalitsky for the Spontaneity Shop. Thanks to Tony and Hannah at PBJ Live and everyone at the Theatre Royal, as well as Brighton Festival and all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. Secretly taken cowpaw. Um, <laughs> you had nothing else in the cupboard. Uh, <laughs> I don't think so. Only because it wouldn't be worth it. Like night nurse. Yeah. Sure. Bring <laughs> it. Down it. Down it in one. That's absinthe. <laughs> Isn't that just absinthe? <laughs> if you mix it with absinthe, it is. Yes. Yeah. It's, uh, actually, it's actually very addictive. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh no, completely. Okay.